It gives me such great pleasure to introduce Hillary Crowley as this year's recipient of the Enid Graham Memorial Lecture Award. Hillary is an exemplary role model for our profession. She has made substantial national and international contributions to the profession in her 46 years of practice, 42 of those as a CPA member. But she differs from past award winners because she's a practicing clinician and not a celebrated academic. As nominators, we really viewed this as not a weakness, but as a key strength of her candidacy. This is because Hillary's impact factor is measured not in peer-reviewed publications or invited presentations, but rather in the quality of her work and the number of individuals whose lives she has improved through her quiet, innovative, and sustainable contributions to those most in need. As we will hear, Hillary's is a unique example of a career that integrates meaningful global health experiences with diverse Canadian expertise in a variety of caseloads and models of practice. In her clinical practice, both in Canada and abroad, Hillary demonstrates a commitment to social justice that is a theme throughout her professional and personal life, always focusing on providing service to those who face substantial social inequities and poor access to healthcare resources. In doing so, Hillary is unique among physiotherapists who work in international health for her focus on taking students and leading clinical placements overseas. Hillary is also a role model for how physiotherapists can be involved in their local communities, as she has used her expertise as a volunteer at high-level sports events and for disability advocacy issues. Indeed, Hillary has contributed significantly as a clinician, educator, leader, and advocate for issues that are central to the values of our Canadian Physiotherapy Association. Moreover, her goal in these efforts has always been sustainability for local communities, capacity building, and education of physiotherapy students. This lecture is timely for the profession, as the role of physiotherapist in global health initiatives has received substantial attention in the media as of late. Hillary, who, receives, who strives to reduce her impact on the earth by living with her husband off the grid in a log cabin that they built themselves, will nonetheless have a long-lasting positive impact on our profession, and she is richly deserving of the Enid Graham Memorial Lecture Award. Please join me in welcoming Hillary Crowley. Thank you so much, Danielle, for those kind words. Thank you so much, Rob. And I'll never forget uh, the day that Rob phoned me in December, um, letting me know that I had been nominated and won this award. And I had to sit down. I was just so shocked. So thank you so, so much. So as uh, Rob first mentioned, uh, Enid Graham, I would like to start off by honoring Enid Graham. And she was one of the founders of the physiotherapy profession in Canada. And she provided medical care to the military during the First World War. And she established physiotherapy training schools both here in Toronto and in uh, Montreal. Sorry, both here in Montreal <laughs> and in Toronto. Uh, and during the Second World War, she assigned physiotherapists to military hospitals, both at home and abroad, and ensured that they had officer rank so that they were paid appropriately. She was an inspiration to her colleagues and well deserves to be remembered and honored annually through this award. She was really the Florence Nightingale of physiotherapy in Canada. I should like to thank the Canadian Physiotherapy Association for awarding this honor to a generalist, a non-academic, and a northern and rural physiotherapist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for that. I didn't expect that. <laughs> I should also like to thank CPA for recognizing the attributes of international development work, uh, the mentoring of students, and the benefits of community-based rehabilitation. And I'm really humbled to find myself amongst the elite company of previous Enid Graham Award winners, or Enids, and with their stellar careers. My goals for this presentation are to emphasize the importance of overseas development work, to illustrate the need to provide equal access to physiotherapy and throughout Canada, particularly in northern and rural areas. And as many of you know, CPA already has a position statement about this, that everybody has a right to rehabilitation regardless of financial standing our availability of the service. But
but I'm going to suggest we need to step up to the plate to make this a reality. To also suggest that student mentoring is needed to entice more physiotherapists to the north and to challenge CPA and the Canadian universities to better prepare therapists to address the needs of our diverse communities. And what I mean by that is for First Nations communities working as a sole charge position or as the only physiotherapist in a multidisciplinary team. Um, because this is the reality after graduation in many, if you're going to work in the northern and rural areas. And I should also like to state that fear of the unknown can be a disability in itself and that we must be prepared to take risks to broaden our horizons. I've uh, titled my talk, Grasping the Nettle. And nearly everybody I've mentioned that to hasn't a clue what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so the white dead nettle is a ubiquitous plant, which if you brush past it, it will sting and create a nasty rash. But if you grasp it firmly, it won't sting. So in the same way, when me we meet challenges, if we grasp them firmly and seize them as opportunities, they can be wonderful opportunities for growth. And I remember my father saying to me at an early age when I went away to boarding school to take every opportunity that came my way. And whenever I meet challenges or I'm not quite sure which path to take, I remember this advice and try and make an effort to step outside my comfort zone and to grasp the new challenges, to grasp the nettle. I chose uh, my career of physiotherapy when I was 15, and I'm so thankful that I did, and if I had my time over again, I would still choose physiotherapy. There's, we all graduate with similar skills, but then we can branch out and, uh, into a diversity of fields. So we could choose to work with hands or home care or uh, hydrotherapy, we could work in pediatrics or geriatrics, in rural practice or urban practice, or in private or public practice. So there's so many, uh, so many opportunities. So it really is uh, a great profession. Um, I worked after graduating from St. Thomas's in London in 1966. Seems like an awfully long time ago. Um, I worked for a year and a half in London at the Royal Free Hospital. And then in conversation with a colleague, we realized that we both had a relative each in South Africa and a strong desire to go over there to work. Uh, I think it was the very next day after this conversation, we'd actually booked our return airfare to South Africa. And within a few weeks, we were on our way. We flew over there in an old Britannia prop plane. And uh, we hadn't written ahead for jobs. We both were quite confident that we would have no difficulty finding work as physiotherapists. <laughs> and uh, we had the return airfare in our pocket, and I had 10 pounds, the equivalent of $30. So this may be an example of grasping the nettle, only I didn't realize it then. So within two weeks of arriving in South Africa, we'd both found work at the Addington Hospital in Durban. And uh, we worked there for a while before moving on to Cape Town. And there we worked at the Hrotuskua Hospital, which some of you may remember is where Dr. Christian Bernard performed the first heart transplant operation in the early 60s. We worked there for a while and then moved on to Johannesburg. And there I worked at Baraguana, the big 2,000 bed African hospital for Soweto on the outskirts of the city. And there I worked in the pediatric clinic. And it was a little oasis where apartheid didn't exist. And I loved my time there. And during this time, Nelson Mandela was imprisoned on Robben Island. And he has become one of my greatest heroes after being released after 27 years, how he could bring his countrymen out from under the grip of apartheid with comparative lack of bloodshed and without bitterness in his heart. I think it's truly amazing. And another hero of mine is Mahatma Gandhi. And he also started his career in South Africa and I love his creed of nonviolence, but also his quote, um, be the change that you want to see in the land. And I would like us all to internalize this quote, and I come back to it again later. And another mantra that's been attributed to him, which I try and live by, is live simply so that others may simply live. 
So I stayed in South Africa. I absolutely loved my time there. I stayed there to the very last day that my year's ticket was valid. And then I returned to L London, and I worked for a couple of more years there in the Franklin Delano Roosevelt School for Handicapped Children. There were no integrated schools at that time, and I must say there was great camaraderie between these children. And I worked there 50% um, of the time in hydrotherapy. And uh, it was great, but after two years, I decided it was to grasp, time to grasp the nettle again. And this time, I decided to emigrate to Canada. So in order to do this, I left by boat from Liverpool. And it's a six-day journey, and I arrived here in Montreal and was met there by the only person I knew in Canada. Um, but what I hadn't realized, it was the eve of Jean-Baptiste Day, <laughs> <laughs> which is a provincial holiday here in Quebec. So uh, she whisked me off the boat and took me to a cabin on Lake Memphremagog. And one of the owners of this cabin was a senior physiotherapist at the Royal Vic here in Montreal. And she suggested that I stop in there on the Monday and see if I couldn't get a locum. She said, they're always looking for physios. So I thought, OK. And so I stopped in there on the Monday and took a two-week locum, canceled my original plan to take the train across Canada to Vancouver. And my two weeks extended to 10 months. And I really loved my time in Montreal, such a cosmopolitan city. And I worked here in the um, Montreal Neurological Institute. They were doing lots of research into Parkinson's and the use of L-DOPA at the time. Had many interesting head injury clients. Also, one of my early patients was Jack Rabbit Johansson. And he had sustained a ski injury at the age of 94 while cross-country skiing. So I was pretty impressed by that. <laughs> this was 1970. So many of you remember the October crisis, the FLQ crisis. So it was a very politically interesting time to be here in Montreal. I believe it's always politically interesting to be in Quebec. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> so in order to get from my apartment uh, on McGill campus to the Royal Vic, I had to uh, walk the gamut of uh, camouflage um, soldiers in every doorway. So it's a very interesting and stimulating time to be here. I don't think Gandhi belongs there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, after 10 months, I decided it was time to move on to Vancouver. And so I beat, uh, bought a beat-up old Volkswagen and spent two months traveling around the state, states and arrived in Vancouver exactly one year late. <laughs> <laughs> and there I went to work for CARS, the Canadian Arthritis and Rheumatism Society. And after about six weeks there, they were desperate to fill a position in Prince George, which is in north central British Columbia. And uh, I was their newest recruit, and so they asked me if I would go up there for a six-month locum. So I was a bit tentative, and I said, OK, as long as you promise you won't forget me. <laughs> and they promised. And so I went. And I'd only been there about two weeks, and I asked if I could stay. I felt really at home in a smaller community. There was no hierarchy in the hospital. The orthopedic surgeon was on first name terms with the janitor, and this was really foreign to my previous experience. My job there was to. Um, work two days in Prince George every week and three days on the road traveling 600 kilometers to the smaller communities west of Prince George. These smaller communities didn't have any physiotherapist, so I was it. So I wasn't just working with people with arthritis. I had a diversity of patients. Um, and it was really enjoyable. And actually, CARS, I think, pioneered a lot of physio in rural areas. And it may be a model that we could uh, replicate because they sent physios to these rural areas um, to work, um, and I was one of them. Anyway, I didn't want to do a second winter of uh, winter driving. The roads were pretty treacherous then, much narrower and windier than they are now. And so I then took a sole charge physiotherapy position in Vanderhoof, a small community west of town. But while I was still working for cars, my supervisor came up from Vancouver and uh, she said to me, you know, you should really seriously start uh, to consider putting down roots. And I looked at her in amazement. The 
concept was quite foreign to me. I thought <laughs> things just happen. But anyway, I must have taken her advice to heart because it wasn't long after that that I married and we built our own log home and I learned to hunt and to fish and to grow our own garden. And so now my roots are deep and well nurtured in northern and rural British Columbia. Anyway, I then went to work at uh, the Prince George Regional Hospital and I worked there for many, many years. But in um, 1994, I uh, decided to grasp the nettle again and to apply to do overseas development work. I'd been wanting to do this ever since that year in South Africa, but the time had never seemed right. But now the children had left home, and I felt if I didn't grasp the nettle then, I would let this opportunity pass me by. So I applied through Action Health, a British organization that sends health trainers overseas, and I applied to become a physiotherapy trainer in a rural community-based rehabilitation program in South India. And from the time of my interview to departure was three weeks. <laughs> three weeks in which I had to learn how to ride a motorbike to be my mode of transportation. And I had to get all my immunizations and I had to take a course on learning how to teach. And it was three weeks actually full of fear and trepidation. I was really scared to leave my home and family. I was worried, would I get sick? How would I manage with the language? Would I get mugged? Did I know enough about pediatrics to be able to teach pediatrics? Because this was a pediatric community-based rehabilitation program. But thank goodness, I grasped the nettle, and I boarded that plane, and I arrived in New Delhi, 47 degree temperature. <laughs> and when I came out of the airport, I was immediately assaulted by all the sights, sounds, and smells of India. And then I took a domestic flight to Bangalore in uh, South India, that purple state near the bottom of the map. And I spent a couple of days in Bangalore to try and get acclimatized. It was still 47 degrees. And to buy Indian clothing, similar to what I'm wearing, as that's what I was to wear in the villages. And the next challenge was to take the overnight train from Bangalore up to the project area. And it is a challenge. And anyway, I arrived at Raichur, the area um, where the CBR program is, and at 5.30 in the morning. Luckily, I was met there by the Samuha Jeep, and as we trundled through the peaceful pastoral countryside, I finally started to relax. As we saw bullock carts trundle by full of people and young boys herding goats along the road, and just the landscape was uh, so nice. And after a two-hour drive, we um, pulled into the gates of Samuha, the name of the organization where I've been volunteering, and was immediately surrounded by a whole lot of brown, smiling faces, and was shown to my thatched hut at the end of the row, which was to be my home for the next year. And in this hut were three concrete beds, a single naked light bulb hanging from the ceiling, and uh, open window, no, no glass in it. And I chose the concrete bed underneath the window, and there were a pair of bullocks pulling a single wooden plow, and I grew to love this place. The peaceful pastoral landscape really hooked me right from the beginning. And uh, this was a community-based rehabilitation program, and my job was to train the um, disability workers. So to start with, I had a team of five disability workers. I was the second physiotherapist to go there. The first therapist had done the basic anatomy and uh, polio teaching. Uh, this was 72% of the children we saw were children with polio. And in that first summer I was there, we saw 32 new cases of polio, as well as all of the old cases of polio. And it was considered then, if a child got beyond the age of two years without any paralysis, they'd already built up an immunity to polio and they would be safe uh, because it was so prevalent. I think like Enid Graham, um, at her time, the returning war wounded uh, really accelerated the physiotherapy profession. But I also think that the polio epi epidemic made us essential practitioners also. So this young girl, she's about eight in this picture, has severe flexor contractures of hips and knees, and all she could do was crawl to get around. 
Her brothers had made her a homemade cart to uh, take her through the village two kilometers to school. So when we discovered her, the disability workers taught the family how to do stretching exercises, and we did serial casting. And when we had done as much as we could, we facilitated uh, corrective surgery for her in Bangalore. And then our orthotic technician made uh, her bilateral braces out of PVC pipe, plumbing material, and gave her crutches. And I'm not sure if you can tell the pride on her face, but here she is standing up for the first time in her life, now able to be at eye level with her peers, so to have that dignity, and to be able to walk independently to school. And there's hundreds and hundreds of similar stories like this of people that have been helped. And I just met her a couple of years ago, and here she is receiving her certificate. She's now a preschool teacher in her village, so she's able to support herself financially and her family. So this um, community-based rehabilitation program, all the disability workers are from the local villages, and many of them have a disability themselves. So this is Mutana, the orthotic technician. He's paralyzed from the waist down from polio, wears bilateral braces, you can see his crutches. But he makes all the prosthetics and orthotics and braces and even the special seating that are needed for the project and certainly does a fine job. So I mentioned we started off with five trainees. By the end of the year I was there, I was actually there 13 months, I trained 12 disability workers in, um, in physiotherapy. Not to be physiotherapists, but to be community-based rehabilitation workers. At the end of, uh, of that year, I decided it was high time to go home and to resume my life back in Canada. And I'd also lost 20 pounds in weight, so I was a little bit concerned for my health. I could actually get my hand right around my biceps by the end of the year. But uh, once I came back to Prince George, I wanted to still say, stay engaged with Samuha. And so together with physiotherapy and occupational therapy colleagues in Prince George, we set up a nonprofit society called SODA, or Samuha Overseas Development Association, to fundraise for this program. And then in 96, uh, Samuha asked me if I would go back there again. They wanted to further expand the program into a new geographic area and to train three more disability workers and to move into 10 more villages. So I did that. And this actually then became a pattern. Every year, I would use my annual vacation to go back to in India for four to six weeks. So Action Health kept sending health professionals, either a physio or an OT or a speech therapist, to Samuha to be trainers up until 99. And then they terminated the partnership because they needed to move on to North India and places in Africa. So I was really concerned that the quality of the work might go downhill with no health professional there to maintain it. So I wondered how best to address this. And I had this idea in the back of my mind of setting up student practicums. And that way, I would create awareness amongst Canadian physiotherapists on the need for overseas development work. But I could also monitor the program without being too obvious that that's what I was doing. <laughs> So around the same time, this was 2000, um, Sue Stanton from UBC was offering an online postgraduate diploma program. And I took the module on program development. And I fashioned this module on setting up student placements with Samuha in India. And as part of this module, I had to do a needs assessment. So I wrote to all the physiotherapy and occupational therapy schools across Canada and also to CPA and to CAOT and to the licensing bodies and to the current students. And I was amazed all the feedback I got was positive. I didn't expect CPA to accept Samuha as a site for practicums. There's no medical model, there's no doctor, there's no hospital, there's no library. And I didn't expect CAOT to accept a physio supervising their occupational therapy students, but no problem. Of course, I knew the students would want to come. And so in 2001, I took the first students, uh, two students from University of Alberta, and it really uh, was a win-win-win situation. The students learned pediatric sk skills, the true meaning of holistic health and client-centered care. 
The disability workers had their batteries recharged and with the new enthusiasm and also learnt more skills. And the families and the children benefited from the more intense inputs and uh, extra skills that they received. So since then, I've taken 17 physiotherapy students and six occupational therapy students with me to India. And they've all been really fantastically successful opportunities. And uh, I would say that the four to one model, I always take at least two students, but the four to one model I found to be the most effective. And especially if they're transdisciplinary. So two PTs and two OTs working in uh, transdisciplinary teams. And then they're learning from each other as well. And uh, it's been a, a great uh, way for them to grow and to learn how to work in multidisciplinary teams. So I mentioned the 32 new cases of polio that first summer. In the last 10 years, there have been no new cases of polio at all in the villages where we work. And this is largely in thanks to the World Health Organization and International Rotary's uh, Pulse Polio Program, where they vaccinate every child under five throughout India every year. And so this is a young lad receiving his uh, vaccine. And in 2012, there were no new cases in the whole of India. So it, it's really amazing because there was so much before. So this is a very good success story. So we started off um, working in mostly with polio. And as polio has been decreasing, and actually that year that I was there also, my job was to continue the polio and to strengthen that, but also to start training in neurology and normal development and cerebral palsy. So now, because there's no new cases of polio, we're spending a lot more time working with children with cerebral palsy and developmental delay. And up until this time, it was all home-based therapy. But in 2010, we did some extra fundraising. Samuha decided they wanted to set up an early intervention center for children up to six years of age. So our uh, charity, yeah, we got charitable status in 2000. Our charity um, fundraised f to equip this early intervention center. So you can see it's looking pretty nice. And it's, it just uh, provides more input for the families. So before, we were doing home-based therapy one day a week to each family. But now they can come every day if they wish. And they can stay all day if they wish. So it's a great opportunity for the parents to be able to communicate with each other and share problems. And if the children um, have speech and hearing difficulties, they can learn sign language here. They can receive um, expertise from special educators. And it's another opportunity for the students to learn. So they now have the home-based therapy as well as the early intervention center. He's here in the audience. Hi, Jonathan. And, uh, because now we've had no new polio in 10 years, and also the program has expanded from um, 12 disability workers, there's now 26 disability workers, and there's now three orthotic workshops. And we do home-based therapy to all the villages in a 40-kilometer radius of each workshop. So it's expanded significantly. So we're now seeing people with any disability of any age. So we're finding we're seeing a lot of young men with spinal cord injury. And when we first started seeing these people in a home base, uh, we discovered that most of them were not surviving more than two years post-injury. And so this was obviously alarming. And it turns out they were given no advice or follow-up after discharge from the acute care. So they would return home to their village and to their hut and sleep on the floor like the rest of the family on dirt or concrete floor, no mattress. Nobody had told them the importance of turning or cushioning. So they were developing these horrendous pressure sores and were dying from septicemia. And some of them were also uh, dying from urinary tract infections because they were given no bowel and bladder training either. So once we discovered that, the first thing the disability workers did when they uh, encountered uh, these people in the home-based therapy was to provide them with a four-inch high-density foam mattress, or else a waterbed mattress, and also a wheelchair with a special cushion. But we still felt we needed to do more. These clients needed a transition from acute care before returning to life in their village. So we did some special fundraising, which we did in December 2011, to build a spinal cord injury unit. 
And we did this through selling virtual bricks at $25 a brick. And we started it in December. And by the middle of January, we had raised the, the $10,000 uh, needed for the spinal cord injury unit. It's amazing how generous people are when they know that every single cent of what's raised goes to the program, and none of it's used on administration or our airfares, heaven forbid, or anything like that. So this is the physiotherapy gym, and it's all been beautifully ramped. And this is the accommodation and kitchen unit. And uh, once we had um, raised this 10,000, we then realized this didn't count the equipment. So in order to sub equip the physiotherapy gym, as well as the accommodation and kitchen, we raised another 7,000. So actually, in 2012, we sent $37,000 to this program. And it's all raised from the local community through friends and family and colleagues. And uh, so it's been great. And it's another opportunity for students. We were there in January with three physio students from UBC. And we took in the first uh, uh, clients with spinal cord injury. So the students were then able to set up the individualized programs. And uh, it was so exciting to see this plan come to fruition. The reason for the spinal cord injury is very unsafe construction practices and falling out of the tree when they're collecting the coconuts. So once you've done some overseas development work, it um, really is, uh, provide, broadens your horizons for doing other work. And so I went to Prohimo in Mexico uh, several years ago. And any of you who have done overseas development work will be familiar with David Werner's book, Disabled Village Children. And nearly all the material for this book is taken from Prohimo in Mexico. It's a wonderful community-based rehabilitation program where all the staff there are local, but not only local, they all have a disability. And most of them have spinal cord injury. I went there because I knew they had a wheelchair workshop, and Samuha wanted to um, start making wheelchairs for their program. And so both of these men have spinal cord injury, but they make all the wheelchairs for the project. And another... Um, way to broaden the horizons, I went with a medical team to Tibet. I was able to convince them that a physiotherapist would be a useful adjunct to their team. And uh, so it was a wonderful experience too. As far as I know, I was the first physiotherapist to go to Tibet to work. And uh, it was difficult though to be effective there because there was no infrastructure to work from. So the medical team referred patients to me. And I did visit the uh, leprosy hospital and provide some inputs there. But um, otherwise, and this is a high Himalayan village only accessed on foot or horseback. Wonderful opportunity. And then through the International Health Division website, Physio IHD, which is rich in resources, I found that the small Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan was looking for physiotherapists to teach in their two-year physiotech program. So I immediately grasped the nettle again and applied through health volunteers overseas who were sending physios on four-month rotations to teach in this program. And so I went there and I taught in the program. And it involved two hours of formal teaching every day and the rest of it clinical teaching in the big teaching hospital in the capital, Timpu. And again, a wonderful opportunity. And then just last summer, um, Sunny Hill Children's Center from Vancouver called me, and they were looking for a physiotherapist to join their team to Ladakh in the far north of India, in uh, Kashmir, the red state at the top of the map, sandwiched between Pakistan and Tibet. So another fantastic opportunity. My job there uh, was to mentor two locally trained physiotherapists in pediatrics. So back home here in... Uh, in Canada. I retired from the Prince George Regional Hospital, now called the University Hospital of Northern BC, in 2001. And uh, I now work part-time, very part-time, as an itinerant pediatric therapist in the small communities west of Prince George, actually the very same communities that I worked in the early 70s as a arthritis physio, now working as a pediatric physio. And I mentioned before, there were no physiotherapists in any of these small communities. 
there's still very few physiotherapists in any of these communities. One of the communities has a full-time physio in the hospital, and the other two communities have no physio in their hospitals. And uh, both, well, three early intervention centers that exist there have been trying to recruit for full-time physiotherapists to their centers unsuccessfully. They just have me. And I only get to each community one day a month, obviously not adequate. And I only get to the more distant First Nation reserves once a year, totally inadequate. So what I would like to suggest, I mentioned that um, CPA already has the position statement uh, that everybody has a right to access of rehabilitation services, that we really need to grasp the nettle and make this happen. There's several innovative programs already in India, I mean, sorry, in Canada. Um, I know of some in Manitoba and Northwest Ontario. There's um, a fly-in physio service. There's the use of tele-rehab. And in British Columbia, through the northern cohort of UBC's program through University of Northern British Columbia, we're starting to address this problem. So 20 of the students do the majority of their placements in northern and rural BC. But in order to make this successful, we need to have enough preceptors in northern and rural Canada to give this opportunity to the students. So just in the same way, I was sent to Prince George reluctantly from Vancouver. And once I got there, I loved it and asked if I could stay. In the same way, a percentage of these students who do their practicums in these smaller communities will find that fits their lifestyle perfectly and will want to stay. But if they don't get that opportunity, they won't know it, and these jobs will go vacant. And there isn't an urgency to this because one of these um, full-time positions for a physiotherapist in one of the communities where I work, they've been able to recruit full-time occupational therapists and speech therapists. And so the occupational therapy hours have been taken from the physio. There used to be two full-time positions, one physio, one OT. Now it's one and a half OT and just me going there when I can. So if we don't address this problem, the funding will dry up and these positions will disappear. So it's really important that we do this. And I think it is our professional duty to step up, grasp the nettle, and be preceptors. And one needn't fear about, do we know enough? Uh, is our anatomy too rusty? The students are well-versed in problem-based learning. They certainly know better than I do how to find resources on the internet. And if we're too busy, the students will take part of the caseload. So, and like I say, the four to one model in India worked great, but uh, I'm just suggesting this. And I would, also like, <laughs> I would also like to mention that we have a wonderful resource here in Canada, ECACABA, the International Center for the Advancement of Community-Based Rehabilitation in Queens. And it was founded by Dr. Malcolm Peak, who's a previous Enid, can you call a man Enid? <laughs> <laughs> and a previous president of CPA. And Ikakaba is famous throughout the developing world. They have set up CBR programs in many, many countries, and they've helped with education of disability workers in many, many countries. So why not Canada? If we can't find physiotherapists to go and work in these remote areas, why not find a different model? And another possibility is the physiotherapy assistance. Um, who CPA embraces, and maybe it's beyond the means of some people in some of these distant First Nation reserves to be able to reach for a master's degree in physiotherapy. But maybe a one or two year course as a physio assistant or rehab assistant is more within their reach. And with all the advances in uh, technology um, through tele-rehab, audio-visual conferencing, Skype, what have you, um, I'm suggesting that supervision can be done more from a distance. Surely it's far better that they have a service comparable to a community-based rehabilitation program, which really helps uh, families in these communities, rather than have nothing, or just have to resort to flying out to a big city where the culture is totally foreign to the people that live in these smaller communities. So I would like to suggest that we grasp the nettle, step up to the plate, 
and make this a reality. I'm not quite done. Oh, I'm not done. <laughs> so just as uh, Mahatma Gandhi said, and now Barack Obama has said, we must be the change. It's not somebody else, and it's not some other time. It's us, and it's now. So let us internalize that. And also, um, I mentioned David Werner's book, Disabled Village Children. He wrote a sequel to that book called Nothing About Us Without Us. Okay, I flipped my rolls. And, uh, and I would like us to remember this uh, when we're setting up new programs in uh, First Nations communities that we consider and consult with the elders and the people with disability and make sure the program we design for those communities is appropriate for those communities. So nothing about us without us. So I now would like to thank uh, my husband, Floyd, who's come here today for all the support that he gives me, for putting up with me taking off for four to six weeks every year to go to India, living on toast and cereal <laughs> while I'm gone, <laughs> for doing way more than his fair share of snow shoveling, because I always go in the winter time, <laughs> and for all his support, not only of me, for, but also of Soda, our charity. So thank you, Floyd. Thank you also to my sister Helen and her husband Peter, who have flown here from England to be here today, and for all their support, for making the effort to come here, but also for the, all the fundraising that you've done in your village back in England, putting on silent auctions, and for all the awareness you've created through articles in the newspaper and the parish magazine. So thank you so much for all your support. Thank you to all my uh, colleagues back in uh, Prince George, several who are here today, and uh, thank them for all their support and all the um, people that are on the board of SODA and for all their support of the work that we do in India. Um, like I say, it's nearly all done through the local community, so really appreciate that. Thank you to all the students, some of whom are in the room today for coming with me and for learning about overseas development work and pediatrics and for creating awareness once you come back to Canada and for all the support you give to Samuha and for all the enthusiasm uh, around that. It's really important, I think, uh, that we do this. Thank you to all of those who nominated me. Thank you especially to Danielle, who helped me with several of the slides for my presentation. And thank you so much to CPA for this great honor. And I just want to mention that there are some uh, brochures at the back of the hall <laughs> if anybody would like to learn more about soda. So thank you so much for your attention. Stay here for a moment. Okay. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Hillary, I'd like to talk to your husband, Floyd, about the essence of spontaneity. This is <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Hillary, your, your story of change and as much change, sustainability of that change in, in Sumaha and, and volunteering to treat and teach 
bridging gaps between professions and, and walking the path of a physiotherapist who, who is immersed in, in primary care and impacting the impact that you and your students have had in, in uh, several parts of the world now, as well as, as well as the impact you've had on prevention and improving quality of life. It's a call to action for both, for all of us here, both in rural Canada and, and as well as abroad. Um, your example as an advocate for both rural health and, and global health is self-evident. And the mark you've left is, is not by what you did or what you built, it's the empowerment you left behind. It's, it's, it's amazing. Bravery. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's not about facing adversity and the unknown without fear. It's about facing adversity and the unknown in spite of your fear. And, uh, and your bravery has inspired us all. It's a, it's a call to action for global health and rural health. And I am inspired. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. Small present. So proud to be able to present Hillary with that, uh, with the certificate and the, the token of our appreciation on behalf of, of your friends, your colleagues, the CPA board, and the physiotherapy profession. We thank you for your work and your exceptional dedication. It is now my pleasure to welcome Michael Brennan, CEO of the Canadian Physiotherapy Association, to the podium to speak on behalf of your research foundation, the Physiotherapy Foundation of Canada. Michael. Merci, Rob. Bonsoir, tout le monde. Um, that concept of grasping the nettle uh, is, is not one I'd heard before. I do wish I was English sometimes. <laughs> uh, wonderful expressions and so on. Um, it, we have an opportunity right now, uh, maybe perhaps to a smaller degree and maybe a less personal degree, to seize or grasp the nettle. Your foundation, um, a few years ago, made some decisions, some bold decisions, uh, and uh, maybe grasping the nettle is perhaps more foolhardy than bold sometimes, but a bold decision to make some change and really aspire to make a difference, uh, to fulfill the promise that the foundation has had since its inception back in the mid-80s. And I'm very pleased to report on a couple of key progress indicators that are inspirational uh, and perhaps will inspire you to consider uh, giving generously tonight. The first is that when we take the awards and scholarships and grants that were issued over the last month or so in combination with the two doctoral scholarships that PFC was instrumental in founding and is a, a partner in with two other groups, uh, the foundation this year made contributions of over $170,000. That is eclipsing previous activity within the foundation. That's a reflection of the tremendous generosity of many of you. It's a reflection of the tremendous hard work of Mindy and Ed and Rosalbi and Mary Lynn, and folks you're going to meet upstairs, folks I'd like you to say thank you to and, and talk to. Uh, but most of all, it's a reflection of our capacity to support research as a profession. Um, I expect that it's going to continue to grow, and I'm very confident uh, that your foundation, the foundation that represents the research capacity of the profession, uh, will achieve great heights. 
I wanted to single out a couple of contributions uh, that are indicative of the kind of spirit and ambition and generosity that your foundation has been generating over the last 12 months. Uh, the first is uh, Ortho Canada. And uh, Alain and Judith, I'm not sure if you're in the audience. Um, if you are, I'd like you to stand. Yeah, probably not, but uh, they will be around certainly this evening. Uh, Ortho Canada over the last uh, 12 months has donated over $11,000 to your foundation. Uh, that's worth your support and your consideration, and I'd welcome you to talk to them about how you can help them contribute further. And a very special contribution that occurred uh, last year in the month of August. Uh, L'OPBQ, uh, l'Ordre Professionnel de la Physiothérapie du Québec, um, in asking its registrants what they felt about the importance of research in Quebec and, and the foundation across Canada, made a very, very generous donation of $50,000 to support research in Canada. So now it's your turn. Um, <laughs> upstairs in La Salle Bonaventure, the Bonaventure room, uh, we have what looks to be a very well-stocked silent auction. So I encourage you to go upstairs, uh, enjoy the refreshments that are available to you, and do not leave without bidding and bidding high. We <laughs> need all the support that we can get from you. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Bonsoir tout le monde.